This is Vox Humana from Radio Netherlands Worldwide. Producer Dira Sujan collaborates with pianist and astrologer Gary Goldschneider to bring you The Stars of Music, a series of programs that looks at the conflicts of music and astrology. This week, in the spirit of St. Valentine's Day, The Food of Love examines the music of love and passion. Now, you know, I Google St. Valentine's Day and came across endless pink pages with flashing love hearts inscribed with, well, mush about St. Valentine's Day. And it kind of reinforced my instinctive reaction against these kinds of holidays. Seems to me that the original sentiment just gets colonized by commercialism. But if you keep digging, you'll eventually come up with what's actually a pretty good story behind all those pink balloons and love hearts. It's said that in the year 270 AD, on the 14th of February, Valentine, the Bishop of Interamna, was put to death by the Roman Emperor Claudius II for flouting his ban on Christianity. A parallel legend claims that mid-February is traditionally the time of a pagan festival of fertility, and so when the Christians came into their own and wanted to put their own stamp on important dates, they took over the date of the 14th because it fits in easily with that of the martyred bishop's death. Because, I should mention here, one of the actions that had actually led to his execution in the first place was that he'd married young lovers against the edict of the Romans who wanted unmarried men for their army. Also, before he was executed, the now Saint Valentine had befriended the blind young daughter of his jailer and his final note to her was signed, yes, you guessed it, from your Valentine. So that's the story behind St. Valentine's Day. But today, I'm here with Gary Goldschneider, who's going to be talking to me about the music of love and what it is that makes music romantic. Strictly speaking, romantic music begins to come about when all these gorgeous poems of the German romantic poets start getting set to music by the classical composers, roman in the sense of telling a story. However, there is no denying that the music of Chopin and Liszt and Brahms that we're going to hear today is highly romantic too. So it's a funny conjunction of these two things, on the one hand the literary and on the other hand the romantic. To you, the most romantic music of all time? Tchaikovsky, for sure. And we're going to deal with Romeo and Juliet, which is probably the most romantic love story of all time, too. In order to really understand love, I think you have to understand another concept not so pleasant, death. Love and death are linked in the 19th century way of looking at it. When there is love, there is always death. It never ends well. So when Tchaikovsky was writing the music for this incredibly famous tale that goes really down to the very heart of our collective psyche, this idea of young lovers who cannot be together and want to be together despite all, and it leads to their doom, how do you even approach something like that? Do you want to aim to make music grand or sweet or sad or what? I think when you hear that melody, that incredible Romeo and Juliet melody, you are going to know exactly what it's going to be. says it all. When Tchaikovsky wrote that melody, it changed music forever. This is a very early work. It comes way before his symphonies and his other melodic outbursts, but somehow that melody is just timeless. It, it makes your heart skip a little bit. It just makes you feel so, so good, and Mozart, Beethoven, Handel, Bach, never thought of writing a melody like that. He was a, a very great melodic genius. That love that he was expressing was not necessarily love for a woman. Tchaikovsky was gay, he was a homosexual, at a time at which it was considered a crime 
to be a homosexual, although there were many in the court of the Russian monarchy at that time. But you remember, at the end of his life, we're always told that Tchaikovsky died from drinking a glass of water and therefore got cholera. Some people even saying he committed suicide by drinking water. Well, now the scholars have unearthed and the Russians have admitted that um, he was probably put out of the way in one way or another because he was having a homosexual involvement with a young member of the royal family. And this gets pretty heavy. The group that he went to school with had a secret meeting like a star chamber. He was there. They ordered him to kill himself. That was it. So love takes all kinds of forms. And there is death again, hovering right at the same time. Can you hear that combination of love and death in this melody? Hmm, that's really a good question. Well, it certainly is for something that I'm playing in the key of D-flat major, not very happy. <laughs> It's not, wow, we're in love. Wow, this is terrific. As Romeo and Juliet are falling in love in the play, Shakespeare amply shows in the psychology that although they are ecstatic about each other, there from the very beginning is something wrong. There's Tybalt and there's her family and you just start to have a feeling that something is going to end very, very badly here. And you can hear that in this music as oh, well. Oh, absolutely. There's some kind of very plaintive thing. As a matter of fact, the second time he gives the theme, instead of playing just the melody note, he plays. And that is pain. There's something there. There's something gripping you and just giving you a feeling that it's not all just sweet. It's very bittersweet. Love. Love is very bittersweet. It's almost like in a sentence where you put the ecstatic point and then you say, but. Exactly. Exactly the same. And so in a sense, he's undercutting the melody by adding that note, something before it that makes you a bit uncertain, uncomfortable even. You said when Tchaikovsky wrote this music, it changed music forever, but there were already romantic composers before him. Beethoven is considered to be one of the first romantic composers. Beethoven was half with one foot in the classical camp and one in the romantic. And I think I can give an example of something which will show that is in his famous Sonata Pathetique, Beethoven lets us have a little look at two things. One is his romantic side, and the other is his love life. You know, he had a big love life, at least when he was younger, many love affairs and romances with members of the court and very distinguished women in Vienna. And uh, when you hear this melody, it's, it's not the Beethoven of... It's not the big, dramatic, fateful Beethoven. It's something totally different. a man just singing and pouring his heart out. So I think only occasionally in his music will he give us a glimpse of that. With Tchaikovsky, it's all pouring the heart out. It's all dramatic. It's all highly subjective. I think what we're talking about is the difference between objectivity, classical, and subjectivity, romantic.
music after Beethoven and after Schubert just gets more and more subjective all the time. The objectivity of Mozart and Haydn and Bach, the objectivity of much of music that had gone on before, now began to be a very personal expression culminating in Mahler. And my God, it gets so subjective there that in the Sixth Symphony he has a heart attack and you actually hear it in the music. You hear that timpani just banging away. So, yeah, the 19th century was moving in in very uncharted kind of subjective waters. What does this signify, that it was only in the 19th century that people really learned to love properly? Well, look how it ended up with the Victorian period. I mean, we could point out that they were maybe the most repressed people that have been around for a long time, but then really were they. Uh, It was a very, very strange way that this whole romantic influence ended up. But it's, um, again, in keeping with love and romance, with the pleasure comes the pain. With the love comes the death. With the wild, imaginative striving and idealization of the loved one comes the disillusionment. Here's what Schubert does with it. I think in this little moment musical, he again is speaking to us. I almost hear the words, ich liebe, or I love you, or something like that. Do you hear it? So I hear, I love you, or in German, ich liebe. And that's coming from a subjective place in Schubert that's really, really deep. Now look at his life. We spoke about Beethoven. Look at Schubert's life. Not only did he die horribly young, but he only had one documented love experience in his life, basically sexual experience, and it was with the woman, maybe a chambermaid, from whom he contracted syphilis that killed him. So the actual spirochete in his blood, in the medical sense, did in the most gifted composer of his time, aside from Beethoven, through love, love, death. So uh, there we are again. question that comes up time and time again in discussions of genius is, can you be a genius without suffering? Can you just be a really happily married person who's been with the love of your life for 50 years and still create beautiful art? Well, in, in the case of music, Beethoven, no. Mozart, no. Handel was either gay or uh, celibate. And then list with all his mistresses, particularly Marie de Gou and Chopin's involvement with George Sand. Now, these guys didn't really specialize in long-lasting, uh, happy relationships. Schumann tried to get to Clara, but she was very young, 18, 19. And his piano teacher, old man Wieck, because her name was Clara Wieck, uh, made it very clear that Schumann should stay away from his daughter, but he couldn't. Clara Schumann was at least as great a musician as he, and certainly a better pianist, 
although he was one of the greatest composers that we know. And in this song called Vidmung, he began to pour his heart out to her. Now, we might have mentioned before that the key of love has to be A-flat major, and A-flat major is Libra. So of all the signs, Libra is the one that could be the most taken up with romantic love. And look what he is saying. He's taking a poem which he didn't write, by Rookert, which is one of the Rookert songs. Do mine azalea, you my soul, do mine heritz, you my heart. And the you is a very personal you, do, not z. Do mine avon, you my joy, oh, do mine schmerz, you my pain. So there it is again, the bittersweet. that no one ever heard anything of, and her husband, Robert Schumann. And then the two men become very close friends. You have a real menage a trois situation going on here. Clara and Brahms fell in love with each other while she was married to Robert Schumann. Schumann goes into the insane asylum. Brahms and Clara are together but can't consummate anything because of their love for Robert. Then Robert dies. You figure, okay, the coast is clear. Now they're going to get together. Never happened. Never as a matter of fact, a little nightmare happened later when Brahms then fell in love with their daughter and started pursuing her. And then Clara made it very clear that he was persona non grata in the house and she never wanted to see him again when he went over that line. And Brahms is then pouring out his heart as well. So let's turn for just a minute, if I can fish out this music, to what Brahms was doing with it. The same key A-flat major that you've been hearing for the whole show, we hear now in Brahms. And listen to what he does with that. Thank you. 
So, so tender and so evocative of the night and of the love that he's feeling. Look at the words here. He puts the words at the beginning of this movement. Words. What do words have to do with the sonata? Where do we find words in Mozart or in Beethoven? Der Abend dämmert, das Mondlicht scheint. The evening dims, the moonlight shines. Da sind zwei Herzen. There are two hearts in Liebe vereint. Joined in love. You're listening to The Food of Love from Radio Netherlands Worldwide. I'm Dira Sajan, and I'm speaking to Gary Goldschneider. romantic artist was a tortured individual, by definition. Without the torture, there was nothing. Finally, it works itself out through Dostoevsky's redemption through suffering, and maybe that's why the Russian composers came to be, in a sense, the greatest of all. You know, they dominate the 20th century with Shostakovich, Prokofiev, Rachmaninoff, one giant after another. But they were preparing for it in the 19th century through Tchaikovsky, and I think it's their genius of orchestration, certainly Rimsky-Korsakov, but their passion, their deep passion and feeling for pain and for suffering, which is in all through their music, very deep music. All these things that we've been talking about, the, the greatness of love and love as a driving force of the most transcendent art and philosophy that we know in history... And then, in a way, we're kind of participating in the, what can I call it, the sacronization of it by actually making a program on Valentine's Day, mm. which has become so very exploitative of the grand passion. You know, now we have, instead of the grand passion of Beethoven and Chopin, we have Hallmark cards. And, and you hate that. No, I share that. But look, Hallmark greeting cards can also call up Disney, and Disney can call up Hollywood, and Hollywood can call up the greatest love theme ever written. What I think romantic music is, is in this piece of music. And I would just urge our listeners to think back to a film called The Seven Year Itch with Tom Ewell and Marilyn Monroe. It's hot. His wife has gone away with the kid. He's left at home in the apartment. And his neighbor, who just happens to be Marilyn Monroe in the sexiest dress you ever saw, knocks on his door. She comes in. They sit down at the piano. And Tom Ewell plays... And suddenly she says, It shakes me. It quakes me. It makes me feel goose pimply all over. I don't know where I am, or who I am, or what I'm doing. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't ever stop. Well, here's what happened, folks. Rachmaninoff wrote this piece at the end of the 19th century. It's not even a 20th century piece. And by the time Hollywood got hold of this, and he moved to California, and all those guys like Bernard Herrmann and Max Steiner and Korngold and all of them, when they heard this melody by Rachmaninoff, they flipped. This became, in a sense, Hollywood. This made all of those romantic, not only tragedies, but comedies that circulated in the 30s and the 40s possible. One piece of music. Once he wrote it, the world was never the same. This is it. This is the archetype. What about 
about the birth signs of these great romantic composers? Schubert and Mendelssohn were all Aquarians. Schubert's Aquarian side was being able to do things quickly and easily, but he went very, very deep. So that gives the lie to the statement that Aquarians are superficial. Beethoven was a Sag. Brahms and Tchaikovsky, interestingly enough, the two biggest romantic guys, when are they born? Both on the same day, both on the 7th of May, under the sign of Taurus, which is ruled by Venus. So those two guys from an astrological point of view, Brahms and Tchaikovsky, would be the most, quote, romantic. And then we'd have to look at the Libras, and there were very few Libra composers, but the one who is, you know, acknowledged maybe as the greatest was Franz Liszt. And here you have his arrangement of the Liebestote, the love death. How do you like that one? Love death, Liebestote, from Tristan and Isolde, written by Wagner in the melody. Once you hear it, you never forget it. A flat major, of course. That's the whole thing. Now, what is so extraordinary about this whole thing is that in real life, there was a kind of acting out going on where Wagner became a character in his own opera, so to speak. You had Wagner... You had Cosima Liszt, who was the daughter of Franz Liszt, and you had Liszt himself. She was married to someone else. His name was Hans von Bülow, the foremost conductor and pianist of his time. She fell in love with Wagner. She left von Bülow for Wagner. They lived together. Franz Liszt viewed this whole thing. Franz Liszt wrote a transcription of Tristan and Isolde for the piano, and when Franz Liszt played that music, he was describing what? Wagner making love to his daughter? It got so close in there with Brahms and Schumann and Clara and with Liszt and Wagner and Cosima. I mean, it's incestuous. It really is. They were all swimming around in each other and in the, in the same kind of uh, milieu with this unbelievable romantic ideal. Even Nietzsche, the greatest philosopher of his time and the greatest cynic of his time, what did he say? All things done out of love take place beyond good and evil. So love has the power to even transcend morality itself. It stands outside of it. And for me, I hear all this stuff in the music. Somehow it bleeds through. You can't separate the life from the work. It's ultimately uh, all one thing. Isolde's Liebestode from Richard Wagner, ending this edition of The Stars of Music. The Food of Love featured the concert pianist and astrologer Gary Goldschneider and was produced by Dira Sujan for Radio Netherlands Worldwide. In the series The Stars of Music, concert pianist and astrologer Gary Goldschneider examines the combinations of his two disciplines. In honor of St. Valentine's Day, we'll be talking about the music of love. Was personal suffering an essential element of romantic classical music? You can find out if you join me, Dira Sujan, for a musical Vox Humana, coming up soon.
The romantic artist was a tortured individual, by definition. Without the torture, there was nothing. Gary Goldschneider is a concert pianist, an astrologer, and a living store of juicy musical gossip. I'm Dira Sujan, and in the series The Stars of Music from Radio Netherlands Worldwide, we'll be looking at the music of love in honor of St. Valentine's Day. Was suffering an essential part of creating the great music of passion in the classical canon? What role does death play in love? And how incestuous, really, was the world of the composers of the great Romantic Age? The Food of Love in Vox Humana this week. Join me, Dira Sujan, for a most interesting conversation with Gary Goldschneider. <laughs> 